All right. They're on their way. Exactly. <laughs> all right, we will start here in a little bit, but as a reminder, I said this earlier, for all of us virtually, our opening hymn that we will sing together is Great Is Thy Faithfulness. Um, I could not find a quality PDF to share with all of you, so I'm sorry about that. But if you Google Great Is Thy Faithfulness or if you go to hymnary.org, H-Y-M-N-A-R-Y dot org, and then search Great Is Thy Faithfulness there, it will give you the lyrics. Um, but especially the second verse of this one, uh speaks pretty directly to what we've been talking about for the last five or six weeks so if you could find that quickly i will find our opening note that's an f sharp is that correct everybody uh, let's see here really quick mm -hmm. That's right. That's 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 sounds perfect. That's <laughs> that's our version. <laughs> exactly. exactly. The the amazing piano you will not hear from me, but that was pretty close. So uh, great is thy faithfulness. All right, we sing this one a lot. This is probably a top twenty hymn. Um, you know, uh, and uh, um, is sung to open church you know, program years is sung at funerals and weddings is sung at all sorts of different gatherings. But um, today we will sing this hymn, thinking about creation, uh, thinking about um, our relationship with and to the earth, uh, and not only what that means for us, but what the hymn writer, the sacred lyricist, Thomas O. Chisholm, is trying to convey to and with us as we sing this. All right. This is in 3-4. This is fun. I think this is the first one in 3-4 we've done. So anyway, uh, we all know this. Hopefully all of you at home have been able to find the verse, or excuse me, a copy of the lyrics. And if not, uh, you at least know the, the chorus. All right? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Here we go. One, two, three. Uh, excuse me, I almost went, went four. It's three. <laughs> one, two, three. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see, all I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness born unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest. So moon and stars in their courses of love. Join with all nature in Manifold witness to thy great, great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon 
for sin and the peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine and ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have need with thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Woo! Everyone sounded incredible. Seriously, actually, Paul Newrider, in particular you, I loved hearing you via the Zoom. That was great. Thank you so much. Oh, the stars. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was it like singing Great Is Thy Faithfulness this morning with all of us, either here in person or virtually, uh, through the lens of creation care, thinking about what it means for our relationship with the earth, uh, with the divine, with one another? Well, yeah. Go Jackie, go ahead, please. Okay. So I have a part of my devotions in the morning. I always yes. this little, um, just a three sentence, and it made me think of that is, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. And um, that's what reminded me of when we started saying it was faithful in prayer. I love that. It sounds like daily guideposts. I read that too. Is that is that Jackie? Is that a daily guidepost devotional? I don't know where it came from. I I have it on my list. Of, of, I have a routine in the morning that I do, and I'm not sure where I collected it from. One of my readings, but um, try to remind myself: be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and always yes. faithful in prayer. Well, this year, that is, that's what's on the bookmark for daily guideposts. So oh. you would read that every day this year. Um, it's a Romans 12, 12 or something like that. I, I, I get the exact <laughs> reference. But, Beautiful. Look um, at you. I mean, I'm looking at that every day. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fat. Well, especially, you know, uh, strength for today and great hope for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a line that we just sang together that speaks directly to your devotion in Romans. And that's moving. Nice. Something that extraordinary about the word faithfulness. Tell us more, please. Um, first of all, just the word faith is conjures up so much, and it also has somehow years with it. It it, mm. it is something that that is a word that has been used as far as I have ever read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then full mm -hmm. has a whole connotation of wonder and, and, and then of course, wonderful, but it is, it's a word that expands with me. Mm -hmm. and, and then great is thy faithfulness. I mean, it's not just, you know, boy, there is a faithful, you know, spirit for us. But I mean, it is just an abounds, which is another yeah. huge thing. Yeah, yeah. I like the fold, meaning joy. Yeah. <laughs> Appropriate for this Sunday. Yeah. Absolutely. I like that. Was there somebody else on Zoom joining us virtually that wanted to share? I thought I heard a few voices at once. And if I, I don't want to miss anyone. No? Okay. I mean, obviously that second verse is, is, is pretty on point. Um, you know, 
summer and winter, springtime and harvest, the entire thing is wrapped up in creation imagery. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, what's amazing is that when you take a look at the very opening line, oh God, my father, then you take a look at the asterisks at the bottom, and some people actually sing this, great is thy faithfulness, oh God, creator. Uh, it gives a little, little different spin exactly on these lyrics, right? Um, so what's fun is that if we take a look also at the very top of this hymn, above the, above the number 39, it says creation and providence. And there is an entire section in our hymnal uniquely placed towards the beginning that in particular has hymns that all deal and all focus on that theme. Oh. right creation and providence and some of those we sang together during this series some of them with that we sang were not uh, i'll actually give a handful of examples later about hymns that aren't found there but that we all know that certainly speak to what we've been talking about you know what we've been discussing and exploring the last couple of weeks um but uh, before we move on any further thoughts on great is thy faithfulness of course i have <laughs> And it, and it is that when you say, uh, oh, God, my, the, oh, what is it? Oh, create. Uh, oh, God, creator, I believe. Oh, God, creator. It's like, I think of my father and I think of, I mean, my, my own father. And my father was many things. He was a golfer. He was a musician. He was a minister. He was, and if I say father, you know, that doesn't, People are always asking, what do you mean by God? And everything? But when you say creator, that's like an aspect mm -hmm. of God in the same way that, you know, oh, the golfer, the this, the that, the this. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate that thinking of, of, uh, of, of, of being mindful of the creator yeah. in this particular way as we speak to God in the many ways in which God represents to us. I love that. Absolutely. Um, I remember when I was in seminary, I was given a 10 page a little pamphlet in a preaching class. And, because, and, and it had just lists and columns of words or phrases, two or three, you know, word phrases combined. And they were all the different ways that we could use to describe or to name God. Mm -hmm. Mm. The creator and father were in there, right? But like they're the different aspects or the different ways that different people, whether one is history or one was preference or how they you know most intimately relate, um, you know, different ways to name, to describe those components, those elements of the divine. You know? um, father, Son, Holy Spirit. But the other way to describe the Trinity quite frequently is creator, redeemer, sustainer. So creator, I love that. Um, so we have, uh, so the, the order of our class today will be, I will bring up a few things. I'll, I'll, I'll raise a few new, um, topics, uh, some about history, some about like the last about hundred years on this, uh, some from multiple faith perspectives and how different faiths, uh, explore or discuss our sacred relationship with the earth, with the divine and one another. And I then will sort of rehash, if you will, the last six weeks we shared together, specifically dealing and discussing this. And then I'm gonna ask us all a question. And so the last eh, third will be discussion. But um, before we do any of that, I, I do wanna share this, which I, I place at this table. But um, this is uh, from a magazine called Presbyterian Life. Here, I'll walk way up to the camera so everybody at home can see this. Maybe not that close, sorry. <laughs> there we go. From 1967, oh wow! In a denominational periodical, and this is the very first time that our denomination wrote anything about the climate, in particular, an article about um, uh, damage that humans have done to the environment. All right, and this this article is entitled "We Choke Together," and it discusses mainly climate issues with air in Boston. But um, 1967, right? And we can read it, peruse it, pass it around. Um, but I do know that one thing that s somebody during one of our classes earlier actually afterwards came up to me and said, you know, I thought that this course was going to be 
you know, just like what's popular right now with being green and solar and that sort of thing. And it ended up being a lot more Bible and theology. I really appreciated that was the comment that I got. And what I find to be so interesting is that what I've been trying to say is that our relationship with the earth, our spiritual relationship that connects that to God is covenantal, but also is both ageless and timeless, right? It is not a brand new thing. Yes, Green New Deal, all that stuff is very popular right now in the news, but that's from 1967, right? That's a year after Silent Spring, I think. Uh, Silent Spring was 66, Rachel Carson, of course. Uh, first Earth Day was what, 70, you know? Um, and obviously, you know, just low, you know, when we think about our country, we've got to go back an additional 60 years before there were national parks. And just what that means about a more uh, na nationwide sort of conservation movement, it's a little bit different than our um, spiritual relationship with the earth. But that article, as well as some stuff I'm going to just share right now, hopefully paints a picture that says this is not a new thing, right? Even in uh, broader arenas than just the faith relationship that we have um, with the earth, with the divine and with one another, this is not new. This has been happening and something that people have been studying and discussing for a long time. The lives of every human, the most importantly, our biblical authors, was much more intimately linked to creation than ours is right now as a relational device. It was linked for food. It was linked for shelter. It was for warmth, for pleasure, and for survival. Some of our favorite images for God might be creator. But some of our more, the more famous ones are Lord is my shepherd. Right, Psalm 23, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down where? Green pastures. Green pastures. You lie down beside the still and water. And what happens then? It restores our soul. Especially in light of Cindy last week. Green pastures, still waters, soul restoration. Where do we want to dwell for the rest of our life? The house of the Lord forever. Right there right there. Images for Christ. I am the vine and you are the branches. I am the bread of life. It should be no surprise that the God who was introduced to Moses using the statement, I am in a burning bush, mm -hmm. a bush that's a flame but never consumed, uses the exact same language to then describe his holy state using words and images of creation to name, to define, to describe that relationship. And then of course, you know, on trial at Herod, who, you know, who are you? Are you the son of God? You say, you say I, I am. Yeah. Aldo Leopold uh, writes this in 1949. This is published by Oxford University Press in a Sand County Almanac. If that was Marty, she was just online. So that's amazing, Marty, that you could be two places at once. Um, there is yet no, Marty, you were just online. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so impressed. That's great. We were busy uh, dropping the compost off at the garden. And we oh, were... look at you. <laughs> so How appropriate for this Yeah, class. that's what I figured. I, you wouldn't mind me being late for class. And great, that's what I was doing. And great theme sweater. Yeah. That's stunning. Oh, thank you. So Aldo Leopold says, uh, in discussing the relationship that he has learned about Americans and their relationship with the earth. There is no ethic dealing with man's relation to land and to the animals and to the plants which grow upon it. The land relation is still strictly economic, entailing privileges but no obligations. But then he notes that something is wrong with that. This is 1949 and says, the extension of ethics to the environment is if I read the evidence correctly, an evolutionary possibility and an ecological necessity is that the land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soil, water, plants, animals, collectively the land. So in 1949, this is what he writes, is that we need to shift to that. In short, a new land ethic 
changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land to plain member and citizen of it. Citizen, let's remember the word citizen, citizen of it. It implies respect for fellow members and also a respect for the community as such. A thing is right, which it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It then would be wrong when it tends otherwise. Um, one of the uh, most popular books that's been released in the last two years to describe our relationship with the earth, this whole green concept, is a book called All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. And in that text, the, 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 um, the moniker of climate citizen is named. And it actually comes from the word citizen that Aldo Leopold writes about in 1949. Now, um, one other quick thing is that I've done my best to make sure that this entire course is not politically charged. There was some concern that that might be the case. So I'm going to give us a definition of environmental justice that does not come from our denomination, that does not come from any faith-based group that's right or left, but comes from the EPA, All right? So this is from a government website. Environmental justice is the fair treatment and the meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Sounds like the EPA. Hmm. Fair treatment means that no group of people, including a racial, ethic, or socioeconomic group should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial, municipal, and commercial operations or the execution of federal, state, local, and tribal programs and policies. That is what environmental justice is from the EPA. And I have a sister-in-law who works for the EPA. Just so we're not just so you all know, what I will ask at the end of the class for our discussion is this question. What does an environmentally just community look like through the lens of Earth care? Thinking about this through eco-theology. Thinking about it regarding our relationship with the divine and to one another. What does that community look like? Now, uh, we've been mentioning that uh, creation care stems from a lot of our scriptural references, right? We just named a handful. I am, I am the vine, the Lord is my shepherd. But it clearly is not just the Genesis story that, uh, that we draw from. Um, our Jewish siblings have similar stories, and so too are many that are found in the Quran. Ibrahim Abdul Martin who is a fabulous thinker and author, has written an incredible book called Green Dean, What Islam Teaches About Protecting the Planet. This book, when I read it, was where I first learned that Muhammad writes, the earth is a mosque. Hmm. Isn't that beautiful image? The, I'm sorry, say that again? The earth is a mosque. Oh. M-O-S-Q-U-E. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So when we think of, uh, when we parallel that, the earth is a mosque with what uh, evangelical theologian Ben Lowe writes, he's a contemporary Christian theologian, he describes the church as a greenhouse and God as the gardener. And when we hold that statement next to Muhammad's, the earth is a mosque, it's clear, at least to me, that this creation care ethos, right, our spiritual relationship with the earth is at least Abrahamic right? Jewish, Christian, Muslim. Uh, Rutgers professor and scholar Pankaj Jain shared uh, this amazing statement about Hindu prayer. Every morning, millions of Hindus say a prayer to Mother Earth when they get out of bed, apologizing for any pain that they may have caused her by walking, walking on her throughout the day. And as the world continues to cycle through uh, destabilizing and fragmented lack of relationship with the earth, 
There is a yearning to learn from the wisdom of those who have come before. And I would again argue that our Hebrew siblings, right, certainly share wisdom about those who have come before. But in particular, the spiritual wisdom of indigenous faith traditions mm -hmm. has been explored much more intently lately by non-indigenous folks over the last two or three or four decades in particular. Uh, in his fantastic and groundbreaking book, Shalom and the Community of Creation, an Indigenous Vision, Dr. Randy Woodley, native Michigander, uh, recognized as Cherokee and a descendant by the United Kitwa Band of Cherokee Indians, and again, in full disclosure, was one of my dissertation advisors, describes the indigenous concept of Harmony Way and notes that this concept that many indigenous people have, hold on to, the Harmony Way, is incredibly similar to the Hebrew concept of Shalom. And looking at the world through the lens of indigenous Harmony Way, the concept rooted in, and I love this, redemptive correction. <clears throat> that sounds about as reformed as one could get, but redemptive correction can bring reconciliation between Euro-Westerners and indigenous people, a new connectedness with the creator and creation, the ability to live into the moment with justice and restoration. And as Randy Woodley writes, a more biblically authentic spirituality. So this is not just something that's been there in our sacred texts for millennium, but is also something that many other faith traditions hold fast to, which is why I firmly believe that this is one of the most interfaith, broadly recognized, and certainly impactful uh, ways that we can look at the Bible, as we can look through our, at our, um, our collective lives together. So uh, are there any questions about those multiple faith traditions or any of those just reactions before I move into sort of our summary of the last six weeks? Well, I had an, a reaction to the concept of hurting Mother Earth by mm. walking on her. Yeah. I, I felt <clears throat> that it is also important for us to feel our own spirit and where we were placed we were placed in the garden and yeah. or however we want to conceive of that but um our imagery is being placed in the garden and of course jesus in the garden and as last week and so forth but uh, that was troubling to me yeah uh, just by walking yeah well yeah i would like to feel that that there's more connection and that mother earth would say i am here yeah. For you. Yeah. I'm no Hindu scholar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you just asked for reaction. That was just absolutely that kept me from really hearing everything after that. I was thinking, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is it, it's 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 fascinating to think about um what you know what that means for any relationship in which we are a part of, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other thoughts? Okay. Are there any from Zoom from folks online? Well, I was I was just thinking walking oh, is yes. sort of a, a metaphor for use, not necessarily literally walking, right? I mean, it's. I like that. Again, and what does it mean to be in relationship with anything? Yeah. Right. You know, what does it mean to be in relationship with folks in this room? You know, what does it mean to be in relationship with the food that we eat? You know, uh, we are consumers, you know, um, uh, oh. you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, oh, I'm blanking on her name. The woman that wrote Braiding Sweetgrass was asked in a setting similar to this, a classroom setting, if she could be anything other than a human, what it is she would be. And she said she'd be a strawberry plant. But one of the most amazing reasons for why is because she's like, because then I would be able to photosynthesize. Huh. I would take from what the sun gives and then I would release back out something that is life-giving, you know? <laughs> and, and, and that was just a fascinating concept to think about regarding her relationship to what she does, but also plants and, and I, ours with consumption. I want to thank Paul. Yeah. Because that, of course, is a much, a much better thought of, during our walk on yeah. this earth, yeah. please forgive me for ways in which I, yes, well, thank you. Paul, did you hear that? Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, yeah. 
that's kind of the way it's it struck me when I, I read it. I, I think it's. Uh, Yeah, I was too literal, thank you. So we began by uh, exploring, examining, and sort of putting into our own words, eco-theology, creation care, earth care, all these different terms, this large umbrella under which this happens to fall. The lens through which we examine, we see, or we explore something. Knowing that the divine relationship between humanity and creation is one that is grounded in scripture, and is shared with all of creation, that that relationship is sovereign, that that relationship is interdependent, and that we have the theological imagination to apply that to multiple different aspects of our life. We then discussed farming and the need for new farming methods, a healthier understanding of where our food comes from, how there needs to be more younger, a younger generation of farmers, women farmers, BIPOC farmers. We've certainly in every single class discussed creation as an element of our liturgical life. Creation imagery that is abundant throughout our biblical texts. Both of our sacraments are intimately connected to the natural world. Our liturgical year and the texts assigned each Sunday are aligned with the seasonal changes of winter, fall, summer, spring the ordinary time and the extraordinary time. And we have sung a handful of hymns. How many of us remember some of the hymns we've sung? We sung Great is Thy Faithfulness this morning. <laughs> we sang Joy of the World yeah. last week. We sang All Creatures of Our God and King. That's the one with all of the, all of the <laughs> Exactly. That's the, what I was yeah. uh, the, 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 the famous <laughs> Mr. Bean skit. You know, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, but some that include this imagery, direct references to creation that we did not sing are holy, holy, holy. All the earth shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. For the beauty of the earth. Earth and all stars, bright shining planets, sing to the Lord a new song. God has done marvelous, marvelous things. Sing to the Lord a new song. Here I am, Lord, of the Lord of sea and sky. Mm -hmm. Go tell it on the mountain. Mm -hmm. Spirit, spirit of gentleness. Mm -hmm. I danced in the morning yes. when the world was begun. I danced with the stars and the sky and the sun. Mother in God, you gave me birth. And of course, this is my father's world. Can we name others? Come to the garden alone. There we go. Come to the garden alone. When we study and intentionally look at our life, at our faith, at sacred lyrics, at biblical text through this lens, it does not get narrower. It only gets more expansive. We have Professor William Brown share with us the multiple different creation stories and how eco-theology is an evangelistic tool used to share the good news of Christ, the redemptive quality, the hope, and that caring for creation helps spread that good news and the love of God. And then last week we had Cindy from the Smithsonian Gardens who discussed about the soul-tending work of caring for a garden, something that many of us in this room and many in the Zoom room are fully aware of. The healing, calming properties that one receives while working in and being a part of garden cultivation. And what stunned me, I had no idea she was going to say this, but was how garden engagement, right? People joining or actively seeking out an opportunity to dig into the earth and to tend and to till after 9-11. I mean, in, in the last 50 years, the only time that collectively church membership has gone up has been after 9-11. There clearly is something there. And I'd love to close this class by reading this section from a book, or excuse me, an essay by Marcus Borg. And in this, Marcus Borg describes the passion of God and the passion of Jesus. This is from Moral Ground, just a bunch of essays about our relationship with the earth. Uh, anybody know who Marcus Borg is? Love him. Can you tell us something about Marcus Borg? 
Well, he's a, a man who was uh, has written many books and had sort of an interesting uh, theological look at God and Jesus and our relationship with each other. I found him very thought provoking. Um, he wrote a book called The Heart of Christianity that I really liked a lot and used um, in teaching a class. Mm. So, yeah. I think we read one of his books for the single book group. At Did you? Oh. I can't remember. It. I can't remember the title because it's several years ago, but it was long yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Meeting Jesus again for the first time. Could have been. Awesome book. Yeah. So he's he's really interesting to me. Yeah. 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 So th th this is by the same author. Uh, so his. Uh, his worldview and his literary style, many of us probably have a little um, affinity to, um, but this is maybe six, six uh, um, paragraphs, but I find it a great way to end this time together before we discuss. John 3.16, perhaps the most famous verse in the entire New Testament proclaims, for God so loved the world. What does God love? Not just me, not just you and me, not just Christians, not just human beings, but rather God loves the world. I conclude by speaking of God's passion. The word passion among Christians has both a narrow meaning and a broader meaning. The narrow meaning refers to suffering, as in the story of Jesus' suffering and crucifixion. The broader meaning is what we mean when we ask of somebody, what is your passion? What do you care most intensely about? What is your dedicated commitment? What's your abiding concern? The answer of this alternative voice within the Bible is clear. God's passion, what God is most passionate about, is the world. We as humans are spoken of as the crown of creation. But that does not mean that we are apart from creation, like lords reigning over creation. Rather, the Bible calls us to participate in God's passion. And God's passion is the whole, the entirety of creation. The world, not just human beings, matters to the God of the Bible. God's passion for the world includes its future. To use a non-biblical but theological word, eschatology in the Bible is not about the end of the world, not about the destruction of the world, but about its renewal and its restoration. The world is good. God will never destroy it. We could. And if we follow that path, God will not intervene to rescue us. Instead, the future of the world will be the result of our collaboration or our lack of collaboration with God. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, paraphrasing Augustine, another African bishop from 16 centuries ago, speaks of divine human collaboration in a memorable aphorism. God without us will not. We without God cannot. For the Bible, the world and its future matters to God. And we are called to participate in God's dream for the earth. Marcus 4. Okay. So, my question for all of us in the next 10 ish minutes is what does this community that we are called to help create, to restore, to do with God and alongside one another, what does that community look like? Does it involve change? Does it not? This is something that we've been uh, studying now, discussing, thinking about for five or six weeks together. Um, I don't mean let's put up solar panels, but I do mean this intimate knowledge, this relationship with God and one another that we believe is covenantal. What does that community look like? You know, I'm thinking we talk about making sacrifices during war, and maybe we ought to think more about making sacrifices 
in order to preserve or protect or you know help the the environment to heal um because i think it does need healing mm -hmm. I, i've been you know really upset about these uh, tornadoes in the midwest because i have friends and family out there and uh and I, I think that sometimes when these things happen, some of the uh, evangelicals will start saying, well, God must be angry with us that he's doing this. And I don't know, maybe it's just mother nature is, <laughs> is upset that we're not taking good enough care of the earth and, and these things happen. Um, but it's, you know, it's something I think we really, we might need to make some sacrifices mm. uh, in order to help nature to heal. And it does seem like um, some of the horrible weather events related, you know, like uh, what went on in Mayfield, Kentucky mm -hmm. yesterday was a um, low coming down with the hot air and, mm. you know, just unusual things for this time of the year, but uh, hurricanes down in the Caribbean and stuff. Um, I think it's it has, there has to be an overall awareness of what we contribute to this this sort of thing, you know, as as living our lives. And and actually, the awareness part of it is is so crucial because I don't know about you, but I go along living my life and I take the trash down for somebody to pick up. And what do they do with the trash? You know, I, I recycle, but I'm not even sure that even though I've separated that stuff, it actually gets recycled, you know? Yeah. I'm not sure. I, so it's a, a collective awareness and an intentionality, is what you're saying, mm -hmm. to really sort of examine things. Um, I took a class with a friend of mine, Beth Norcross, who is into creation care. And one of the big takeaways that I came out with was how important water is. Mm -hmm. And it's, easy for us because we've got water and everything. But I, now when I brush my teeth, I, I turn the water off after I, mm -hmm. while I'm brushing, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where before I would have let the water run the whole time. You know, mm -hmm. that little one thing is sure. one thing that I've done, but not to award myself anything other than an awareness <laughs> piece that changed my behavior. So. What? Yeah, it's, it's uh, your relationship is, water is different if you've ever tried to camp or any place where you had to tote your own water yeah. for everything yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, that's the whole awareness thing that most of us never really yeah. focus on i know it's true mm -hmm. sandy you just unmuted do you want to say something yeah yeah i was just thinking about that wonderful uh Hindu statement that you read and thinking that um, making a uh, saying a, a belief is is only the beginning when you think about the air pollution problems in India I mean I don't know what we can do about it but but it's certainly an example of that there needs to be uh, saying a prayer of, of gratefulness for the earth is only the first step we have to do Everyone has to do a part in 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 getting rid of pollution. Thank you. It seems to me that man, as a species, has a penchant for just wanting to dominate and take over and not care about the consequences of mm. their actions and the implications for the earth or and future generations. It's a, a, a historic trend. Yeah. Well, so that, in the Bible, it said man was given dominion <laughs> over the creatures on the earth and all that. Excuse me for interrupting you. That, that's okay. Um, and, and that actually was one of the discussions we had at an mm -hmm. earlier um, session, the, the different meanings of that word. And was it, what did dominion really mean? And what was the implication of that? And, and I, I certainly think that um, it, it goes beyond just the English interpretation of that word, that 
you know, we're not the only, yeah. what do I want to say, century that has behaved in practices that were um, detrimental to the earth. My, my interpret, and I don't know if this is proper biblical interpretation, but I've heard it interpreted as stewardship, which includes dominion, but also Care, uh, uh, that caring, you know, more. I mean, it's still, it's your, if it's your stewardship, you still get to decide where the resources go, you know, as steward. Uh, but I don't know if that's a proper interpretation from the Greek group. That's just a 20th, 21st century, century <laughs> invention. But we seem to think that having uh, power over something doesn't include responsibility for taking care of it. Stewardship and, and, does. And we, but stewardship does. Yeah. And, and and I think you're absolutely right that that but we seem to have missed that. You know, yeah. we want the power, but we don't want to take on the responsibility yeah. a lot of the time. Yeah, there's, I, there's a lot of oh Paul, go ahead. Oh no, sorry. I was just gonna say, yeah, no, it, that that quote about being given dominion, I think is I it upsets me a lot because I think it's been wildly misinterpreted, you know, strongly misinterpreted. And, you know, and I mean, when you talk about, let's say, a ruler having dominion over his people, it, it's never seen as just, you know, you know, you may have the right and the ability to destroy them, but that's certainly not an example of, of good rulership or yes. good dominion. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in other traditions, uh, well, and, and and Western tradition too. You know, the the ruler has a has a responsibility to everyone under his care in the same way that you know, like man has responsibility over all those in under his dominion. And that, I mean, I have to say, I hadn't thought of the God so loved the world part, but I think that's a a really strong sort of continuation or extension or refinement of what dominion might mean. There's a, there's a lot of recent scholarship um, sort of taking a different, uh, a different view of the Genesis 2 story, not looking at it textually, saying, what does dominion mean? What does that verb mean in Hebrew? But what does it mean to know that, one, that uh, a story that is so central to so many different faith traditions demonstrates humans botching the relationship with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Has that given unintended permission to continue that cycle? Because we screwed it up in, in Eden. So we'll screw it up in Alexandria, you know, wherever. Um, and, and just what, 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 not necessarily what the text says, but what the moral of the story, right? What the last line of the Aesop fable means as we live into it knowing that that is wisdom that has again abrahamic you know i mean i mean the three three of the world's largest faith traditions have that story within the sacred text and so it was, it, it's been interesting to think about that um for a different class but uh not just the I mean, we presbyterians are so good at what does the language say but not necessarily what do we say what does the meaning of the story result in, right that That's, there were consequences absolutely for their messing up and that's, you know, why I think we end up thinking that maybe God is mad at us or nature is mad at us with that there are these storms that are so destructive. Those are some of the consequences of our not doing a better job of taking care of the earth. Well, and some people read into that as that's just what we're destined to be. We're fallen. Well, and, and I was just sitting here thinking about that. So how does original sin and our sinful nature where what is the role of that in this whole concept yeah. and and when i start thinking that way unfortunately i always go to the what's the you know it's all yeah. out of our hands it's all you know we're doomed to whatever the consequences are um so not that's not a good place for me to go <laughs> well that's certainly I, 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 I would definitely when anyone gets to that point would think of the last verse we just said right strength for today and great hope for tomorrow and I guess one of the tiny hopes, positive things I've seen out of COVID, at least in our area where we live, is that there seems to be a more of appreciation of our surroundings. And you see it, in, I see it in the neighborhood I live in, mm -hmm. where people are 
outside, appreciating their outdoor space, their gardening, their cleaning up, they're doing other kinds of things. That seems to be the one one of the positive things I've seen out of COVID. That people seem to have more respect for their outdoor environment. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the way I explain the mystery is uh, I, I believe in miracles and I think gravity is one of the biggest, greatest miracles. Uh, you know, we don't understand God's plan, but gravity is a great, great gift to us. But every once in a while, it it uh, stumbles us, you know, <laughs> you know we fall well off the building, you know. <laughs> but in the scheme of things, it is a real miracle that we have this thing around us called gravity. Mm. And I just consider, uh, when I start thinking about God's plan, maybe we don't understand. Maybe this, we have to take a few pitfalls with the uh, all of the wonderful things he's given us. And we just have to learn how to manage it a little bit better, you know? I'm, I'm so sorry. Sandy, your hand was just up. Was that intentional? Yes. Um, I just wanted to bring up an example of how there can be competing interests amongst uh, two, two views of both trying to help uh, preserve nature. And that is, I got an email this morning from the Loudoun County Nature Conservancy. It's an organization I support, and I think they're very wise. And they are uh, calling to action people to ask at the Board of Supervisors meeting coming up to protect a park called Bless Park, B-L-E-S, which is off Route 7 <clears throat> um, in the Lansdowne area off Loudoun County Parkway. And uh, the Planning Commission has voted down the proposals, but are now before the Board of Supervisors. As I understand it, the Board of Supervisors wants to make the park more accessible to people by putting in more boardwalks, putting in a, a, a road that goes next to the wetlands. And the Conservancy is saying, you're going to destroy mm -hmm. what is there in the natural environment if you do this. You see the competing interest of trying to bring it to yep. more people, you actually hurt the wildlife, the bird life, the otters and things that are in this 137 acre park. I think it's just a very interesting example of how uh, both sides feel, well, we, we want to do the right thing, but they're competing. Yeah, yeah. Dan, I'm, I'm sorry, Mary. Dan, sure. Dan and then Mary. Well, I was just gonna say that it seems that the hard part is that we feel in order to make something happen, we have to organize. Mm. And as soon as we organize, it becomes political. And so then we're shut down. Or, or there's hierarchy. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. And so I, I understand because I also, like Anne, there was a time when I, when I brushed my teeth and the water just kept going. And it's those things. And I remember, and I remember when our country used to be littered and then people, you know, there was a little thing on TV, you know, about sure. littering and then there's like Smokey the Bear and there's the forest fires and so forth. And it's the things that we can all do without feeling like we're either like, you know, <laughs> Janet was saying or something, you know, get like, oh my God, you know, it's just too much. I can't compete with this or that or whatever. So I think that the way we, if we can keep it calm mm -hmm. and keep it, moving forward and make people feel good whether you're recycling and then of course you can get into where's it going well at least we're feeling something and every time we feel something and do something that we feel is good we're we're moving forward and you know our breath our air is not something you know people have put bad things into it but we at least understand that everybody has a right to breathe. I mean, I hope we understand that. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's like, I think the more we can keep it calm, keep it within our spirit, keep it within our relationship to God mm -hmm. and what God wants us, how, you know, how yeah. we to be stewards, the better. Because the more we try to organize, the less we're, because people don't want, people in power don't want organization. They fight organization all the time because, it's a it's a threat. 
Yeah, the minion is. Mar Mar Marty, and then we, we, we probably should get to work. Okay, I just was going to point out, uh, we do have some successes, you know, and I was involved in the uh, cleaning up of a small park called Harley Park in the ground areas and for, of evasives. And we've had such good success that some people thought it would be a good place for a dark dog park now that they saw open area, which of course is a very inconsistent look, uh, uh, use. Luckily, one of the people that was involved in the cleanup was also on the committee deciding the use. <laughs> yeah. And she explained how dogs in natural areas, uh, if you don't know why, I'll, I'll explain it to you <laughs> later. There's a lot of problems chasing the wildlife. Uh, they get off lease, they, they destroy stuff, and, uh, you know, they, they're, they're just not compatible with natural areas. And uh, so, you know, one step forward and we stop, and it's a nice, it's a lot better. There's still a lot of work to be done on that particular park mm -hmm. to get it all done, but it's so much better than it was. So yeah. we one step at a time. Do, do what we can. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, in sum for this, for this series, uh, I'd like to thank everyone, not only for being here, but for sharing, but for actually singing. <laughs> There's not a lot of adult formation classes where singing ends up being a part of it. And I'm grateful for all of your courage in living into that together. I think that's been a fun part. I, I know that when I planned this in the summer, I was hoping that we could all also include eating and there would be a, a food component to each of these. And that unfortunately did not come to fruition, but um, maybe next year uh, we can do that. But, you know, we can talk about bees and try honey. You know, have those flowers from those farmers that were here earlier. Um, Hope for the future. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there is no adult formation next Sunday. Uh, there is none the 26th or the 2nd, but we are back every Sunday of the spring. Um, and uh, information about who teaches each class in the spring can be found on our website. Uh, we start with Matt Taylor will intentionally be discussing um, uh, God's suffering as part of this pandemic and what that means about our own suffering and how God suffers. And it's a month long series on our faith in relationship to the pandemic. So it should be pretty exciting. Um, would anyone like to pray? I'm happy to, but if anyone else would like the chance or the opportunity, let us pray. Oh, Jackie, did you want to pray? I'm so sorry. Did you just say something? No, I just said, I'm following you. Let us pray. Okay, let us pray. Go ahead. Dear God, we give you great thanks for today. We light the pink candle, the pink candle of joy and of anticipation. And as people bound together in text, in faith, in love, and in hope, uh, we look forward with great anticipation about our work together, about our work together as a people of covenant, but our work together as a people of faith and as a work together as a people of Christ. Continue to be with us and to bless this church as we live into one of the holiest seasons of the year uh, as we anxiously await the birth of Christ and the coming again uh, all things holy. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alternative giving bazaar today too, right? Amen. Yes. Very important. You got your pink on. I do have my pink on. Absolutely.